the question of cryptocurrencies, and we think if we think about cryptocurrencies, or digital currencies, a natural way to think about them as currencies. So probably the whole concept of cryptocurrencies is much broader. You can think about cryptocurrencies as an asset, maybe as a stake in the future of the blockchain technology. You can think about this maybe as a digital gold, or you can think about a variety of other ways how cryptocurrencies may be or may become. But one of the key questions that is on the minds of the regulators, on the mind of common public, is whether digital currencies are currencies and what impact they will have on the monetary policy. And that's a question that bothers everybody from the central bankers around the world to probably like if you have a, a conversation with your relative who is uh, maybe a little bit less convinced about cryptocurrencies, but they probably have heard about the question of Bitcoin. And uh, they think of Bitcoin certainly first and foremost as currency. And they'll ask the question, well, what is it for? Can it create competition for, for, for a dollar? or for uh, euro or for any other currencies. And hence uh, the question of digital currencies as currencies is perhaps one of the key questions of the whole theory and practice of uh, cryptocurrencies. And today we have exactly a panel, a seminar that, that's gonna give us two important views on the state of the art and research of what, of how we should think about cryptocurrencies, digital currencies as currencies. And we have two very distinguished uh, panelists and presenters, uh, Will Tson and Daryl Duffy. Uh, let me just briefly talk about them. So, so Daryl probably does not need uh, much of an introduction. He's done a variety of works uh, on an immense number of topics, but some of which are very mathematical, some of them are very practical and everything in between with the foundational impact on pretty much all of the areas of finance. From the, uh, somebody who is interested in cryptocurrencies, one of the great things about having Daryl work on this is that it says that the profession, the finance profession, uh, stopped viewing the question of cryptocurrencies and digital currencies as sort of an amusing phenomenon where you know maybe it's like the Lego blocks and the price of Lego blocks, which uh, perhaps it's amusing to study, maybe publish a couple of papers, and it's moving into one of the key mainstream economic questions. And Will Tsong was one of the first uh, contributors who have written fundamental papers on the theory and on the empirics of uh, cryptocurrencies that changed certainly my understanding of how I view cryptocurrency as, as an asset. So we have a very exciting panel from somebody who has done foundational work in finance more broadly, coming and contributing to becoming the central part of cryptocurrencies. And we have uh, somebody at a different uh, stage in the, in the career who has already done the foundational contributions for the cryptocurrencies and will bring this in a broader, in the broader context. So we'll have a very exciting panel today and uh, take it away. So we'll have Will uh, go first. Uh, thank you very much, Ali, for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I have to say uh, what I'm going to talk about today is on uh, CBDCs, the uh, central bank digital currency and digitization of money in general. I've learned most of the material actually from reading what Daryl has written over the past you know, couple of years. Um, so uh, definitely looking forward to uh, hearing more uh, uh, about what he has to say. And also um, from you, Ale, uh, as well, uh, I've learned so much about the uh, empirical side of uh, digital assets and cryptocurrencies. Um, so, so those are uh, definitely very helpful. Um, what I hope to present today is this paper on the coming battle of digital currencies. The title also is CBDC. Um, this is joint work with uh, Simon Mayer, who's uh, from Chicago Bulls right now, and he's going to be a uh, faculty member at HEC Paris starting this summer. Um, our study is definitely motivated by uh, 
the recent rise of digitization. Let me just make sure I can move my slides. Perfect, yeah. Um, so we are in the era of uh, increasing digitization. There's increasing demand for peer-to-peer -peer interactions in digital networks. And there's also the rise of gig economy where uh, you know one day I could be a Uber driver, tomorrow I could be a Uber passenger. Within such digital systems, what we really need is a system or infrastructure for uh, value and uh, information to be exchanged effectively. And because of that, we've seen over the past decades, the rise of private payment systems, including PayPal, Alipay, so on and so forth. Uh, and more recently, blockchain technology provides a alternative for um, facilitating such a payment system uh, with the use of either uh, base layer coins or higher layer crypto tokens. I'm going to refer to them as tokens or cryptocurrency in general. Um, it definitely has reached a large market size. I don't, I don't have to say too much uh, about this uh, exponential growth of stable coins, total value locked in decentralized finance protocols. Uh, what I do want to mention is not all cryptocurrencies and tokens are created equal. Um, they actually serve very different economic functions. Um, I've done some earlier work on platform tokens, but what we want to focus on today is really what I would call general payment tokens. Tokens or cryptocurrencies that are introduced for general payment purposes, they are meant to co compete with fiat uh, currency that we uh, have. Um, and within that category, central bank digital currencies are definitely very actively researched by both academics and central bankers. Um, and, you know, without going into the details, we've definitely had uh, quite a number of seminal contributions in that direction. And many of you in the audience have contributed to that area. Um, and mo most recently, just from uh, President Biden's executive order, central bank digital currency or digital currency in general, is also highlighted as a important uh, dimension for uh, policy recommendations and debate. Uh, I'm sure uh, Daryl has more to say about this, uh, he, he's done, he's testified in front of the uh, US Senate uh, Committee on Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs, and also uh, in front of the House of Lords um, re regarding economic affairs uh, in the UK. So that's a uh, very exciting development. And here I'm just showing you a map of the various central banks researching on CBDC or introducing CBDC. And you can see one country has already launched CBDC, that's Nigeria. China, of course, has been very active in this space as well. And uh, it has rolled out the uh, ECNY, which is used to be called uh, DCEP a couple of years back um, uh, since 2020. And um, just earlier this year during the Winter Olympics, it was also um, test run uh, with more international users in general. So all these development lead to um, several important questions, right? How would the emergence of cryptocurrency affect competition among fiat currencies across different countries? And will they challenge the US dollar dominance? And for countries who are experimenting with CBDC, when uh, should they introduce it? And what are the trade-offs involved? What about stable coins? is requiring the reserve uh, of a particular fiat backing the stable coins, the right policy approach. In order to start to um, examine these questions or respond to these questions, um, what we want to do in this study is to build a dynamic model where there is currency competition among countries, uh, more specifically between two countries, um, but they could use either fiat currency or private cryptocurrencies um, and, or digitized central bank backed currencies. Uh, what we want to do is to rationalize recent observations uh, within this space um, in, in terms of digitization of money and the introduction of stable coins and CBDCs and make a number of predictions and model implications uh, about the effects and benefits of CBDC issuance and the digitization of money. So just very quick overview of the model 
In the paper, we build both a two-peer model and a fully dynamic model. In the interest of time, I'm going to focus on the dynamic model. Um, here, the two-peer model does, um, you know, in some aspects, illustrates the intuition a bit, a, a bit better uh, at the expense of not being uh, as general as the dynamic model. In the model, we have two countries. Uh, we're going to label them A and B. Um, a is going to be the strong one, uh, a, a concept that we're going to make um, very specific in a little bit. There is a crypto sector or cyber sector with a representative cryptocurrency. Uh, I'm going to tell you more about that currency uh, over the next few slides as well. Um, currencies, either fiat or digital, would fulfill all three functions of money in, in that regard. We're going to talk about their roles as store of value, um, as a medium of exchange. Uh, we're going to model it in very reduced form through a uh, specification of convenience yield uh, from, from the usage of that currency. And the stronger currency is going to be denoted as a reserve currency. It's going to serve this function of unit of account. Um, we are also going to endogenize the growth of that crypto sector and its adoption. Countries are going to strategically exert effort in order to launch CBDC uh, in this model as well. So what are the key findings? Uh, here is a quick overview. Uh, first, we um, verify that there is this feedback effect, even without cryptocurrencies, there's the feedback effect of a country's kind of fundamentals and its uh, currency strengths. Sometimes it's referred to uh, the, the vicious circle of inflation and depreciation, and it's related to the concept of dollarization as well. Um, not our main uh, contribution, but it's good to, to uh, confirm that it's present in the setup. Uh, importantly, we do find that the rise of cryptocurrencies is going to hurt the stronger currencies, whereas it's going to mitigate the dollarization coming from the stronger currency onto the weaker currency. So in a sense, it could potentially benefit weaker currencies. One important set of results that we derive is this packing order in terms of the incentives for countries, governments, central banks to implement digital currency. It turns out that the countries, uh, uh, central banks that are, are the most motivated to introduce CBDC um, are the non-dominant currencies. They are not the strongest, but they are not the weakest either. They want to introduce CBDC to gain a first mover advantage, um, followed by the most dominant currencies, such as uh, US dollar. And we'll talk about uh, the two peaked incentive for the strongest, so for a country with the strongest currency to introduce uh, digital currencies. And uh, last in queue are the weak uh, economies, small open economies with very weak currencies or um, even absent a national fiat. Um, example will be a, uh, a El Salvador, uh, which has adopted actually Bitcoin um, over the past few years. So um, in addition to that packing order, uh, we also look at the long run effect of the digitization of money. Weaker countries, CBDC is going to hurt the crypto sector the most. And countries with the weaker currency, even though they benefit in the short run from the introduction or the rise of cryptocurrencies, they are actually prone to digital dollarization in the long run. And strong, the, the strongest currencies are there to potentially benefit in the long run um, through digitization of money. In addition, we do uh, show that the rise of cryptocurrencies can spur financial innovation, um, but the, the introduction of CVDCs will have an e effect that's going to be dependent on a country's original um, strength of, of its fiat currency. There are a couple uh, more additional results. I, probably wouldn't have time to touch on. Uh, our framework allows the analysis of stable coins that are packed to a fiat currency. And we can talk about how the reserve requirement is essentially allowing the regulators or governments to have a way or to, to, to delegate this digitization of money to the private sector. 
Um, and um, the rise of cryptocurrencies and CBDCs are going to have particular effects on small open economy that I already mentioned, basically uh, many developing countries. They are going to face this challenge or this dilemma of whether they should develop their CBDCs versus directly adopting a cryptocurrency or stable coin. Um, and uh, there is going to be strong digital dollarization for these countries, something um, the uh, policymakers have to think about uh, within those countries. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the literature and uh, just jump to the model directly. So um, I'm going to present a dyna full dynamic version of the model. Um, so time is uh, infinite. Uh, we're still going to look at uh, discrete time periods uh, in DT. And uh, by taking the uh, continuous time limit, we, we pretty much get the continuous uh, uh, version of the model. Um, so there is going to be one representative household. Um, it's OLG in the sense that it lives for DT period and then um, uh, the uh, replacement household is going to come in. Um, we're going to have a numerator. Um, uh, that's essentially the consumption goods. Consumption goods in this economy um, are perishable. So uh, each house, the represent household is going to be endowed with one unit of this consumption good. Uh, however, the consumption utility only comes towards the end of the period. So they have to use different type of currencies to store the value and consume towards the end of this DT period. So money in that sense serves um, as a store of value, uh, whether it's fiat or cryptocurrency. Um, there are going to be three types of currencies in the economy. A and B denotes the fiat currencies of country A and country B, and C is a representative cryptocurrency, which could potentially uh, correspond to a, a stable coin. Uh, we'll have more to say about that uh, in the paper, uh, and I'm going to show you how we approach that problem uh, without uh, going into much details. Um, in terms of uh, the uh, modeling the link between countries' economic fundamentals and currency strengths. What we're going to assume is that the two countries, A and B, uh, each one needs to raise tax uh, to cover the uh, fiscal expenses. Um, the tax prepared uh, is comprised of two components. There's the component of uh, kappa, which is essentially the amount denoted uh, in the consumption goods. And there's also uh, a uh, component uh, coming from, for example, servicing debts denominated in some global reserve currency or making payments for international trade that's denoted or, or quoted in some uh, global currency. And what we have in mind is basically US dollar. Uh, Gopin Nash and co-authors have uh, a few papers and uh, Matthew McGarry and co-authors also have a number of studies showing uh, there's a significant uh, amount of cross uh, national holdings of securities that are denominated in, in US dollar, for example. It was uh, a, quite comparable between US dollar and euros before the financial crisis, but after the crisis, US dollar definitely has played a very dominant role in terms of being an international unit of account. So we, we can cover that. It's not that crucial that, you know, this pi constant um, is a positive constant. If a country is a net uh, lender uh, or exporter, it could be negative. What is important is that net, each country needs to cover some expenses. And that's going to allow us to, to generate a certain uh, feedback effect. Um, essentially, uh, the depreciation uh, of currency X with respect to consumption goods is going to uh, lead to the other country competing away uh, the representative household's allocation, which in turn is going to lead to further depreciation of the currency. Okay. So that's not something uh, new. Uh, it's just good to confirm uh, it's present. It's something that people have talked about um, in, in, uh, in, in the media and in a number of studies. And um, the second function of money that we model is money as a medium of exchange. 
So cohort T's holding um, of currency X, remember X corresponds to either A, B, or C, the cryptocurrency C. Um, when the supplies are normalized within each period to be unit supply, um, then the, the cohort T's holding has to add up to their total endowment of consumption goods, which is one. Um, the way we model money as a medium of exchange is by specifying this convenience flow function when someone holds currency A versus B versus C. So the household's utility flow is going to be their consumption during that period, towards the end of the period, plus the convenience yield uh, during this DT period when they are holding these currencies. And um, the function, of, the functional form for this uh, convenience flow is uh, generally flexible. When we uh, solve for the numerical uh, plots, we have to plug in a functional form that I'll be specific about. Um, in equilibrium, the consumption during this DT period um, is essentially the endowment of one unit of uh, consumption goods minus whatever tax payment the household has to pay to the two countries. And we're going to specify this uh, function B such that it's always beneficial to, to hold at least some uh, residual or minimal amount of each currency. Um, and I'll, I'll be specific when we come to that uh, formula. In terms of the cryptocurrency, um, the representative households would uh, allocate um, MC uh, amount that represents the adoption for that cryptocurrency. The crypto sector does evolve endogenously. So if we introduce a concept of the productivity of this, say, blockchain platform or uh, cyber economy crypto sector uh, using YT, YT is going to evolve over time and it's going to be facilitated uh, by the amount of um, uh, adoption that we have for cryptocurrency. So the higher the MC is, the faster the growth for, for the productivity of the crypto sector is going to be. Okay. We don't have to introduce brown emotion, we could, but uh, basically we're modeling a path of uh, growth for the crypto sector and how that's going to affect currency competitions. Market clearing with unit supplies for each type of currency implies that um, the, 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 the valuation for each currency has to add up to one, right? The, um, total consumption uh, goods endowment is one. And we can talk about stable coins by modeling them as uh, currencies that require a reserve of the fiat currency that the stable coins are packed to. For example, if it's uh, Tether or USDC, um, it's just going to require a number of uh, US dollars to be held in the background. What fraction of reserve? We can set it to be theta. And in, this, in the paper, we do analyze how it affects um, the, the outcomes, but in the baseline, we're just going to set the, the to zero. So we're not focusing on stable coin um, at the moment. But safe to say that pegging and uh, requiring the stable coin to hold reserve in a particular fiat currency, is going to mitigate uh, any negative effect of the rise of the crypto sector on the fiat currency that is packed to. Okay, um, so we know the household is, uh, is a price taker and it's going to maximize um, the uh, uh, flow utility in each period. And we don't have to introduce separately interest payment on these currencies due to money neutrality. Any appreciation can be um, viewed as you know, being distributed out to the household uh, in the form of interest payment. So we are agnostic on um, the specific design of CBDC. Is it interest rate bearing? Um, is it centrally run versus being implemented through the existing banking uh, system? Um, that's, that's something we don't go into details. Uh, the way we model the introduction of CBDC is that a country or a central bank can exert effort EX Remember, X corresponds to either A, B, or C. Um, and there is a Poisson arrival of 
the successful launch of CBDC. We do know launching CBDC takes effort and time, uh, both in terms of figuring out the technical aspect, uh, as well as coordinating large institutions to, to uh, actually use it. Uh, but the benefit that what we're just going to say, the benefit, net benefit of introducing CBDC or digitizing the fiat money is going to increase this coefficient related to the convenience flow of the uh, fiat currency from ZL to ZH plus a component that's related to how developed the crypto sector is. So the higher the Y is, the more DeFi innovations there are uh, in the crypto sector and also the, the, the more mature blockchain technology is, and that in turn would allow an additional uh, increase in efficiency when one introduces CBDC. Um, it, it's, it's not that crucial in general. Basic, uh, the, the benefit of introducing CBDC or digitizing money is that it increases convenience yield uh, for holding that country's currency. And once a country introduces CBDC, um, the fiat is replaced by this digital currency. Um, country X, uh, X could be A or B, is going to maximize their uh, prepared uh, senior arch, um, subtracting the effort cost, which, which is specified to be a quadratic effort cost. This is one way to model country uh, uh, government's objective. There are uh, alternatives. Um, but we believe the uh, general intuition and channels would go through. Um, so the, the way we solve it is by keeping track of the state variable. What are the state variables? The state of the crypto sector, Y, right? The productivity that's constantly evolving for that, for that sector um, is important. And whether countries A or B um, has introduced CBDC is important. So we use Z to indicate the status of CBDC launch. Uh, A would mean country A has introduced CBDC, but B hasn't. B can still be experimenting and exerting effort. It's just the arrival uh, is not there yet, right? Because the success is a personal arrival. The functional form for convenience is specified in, in the uh, CRRA form, current form, um, uh, for our numerical plots. And we take some baseline parameters that I'm happy to explain further, but uh, the important parameter will be this pi, which can be viewed as a form of inflation of the fiat currency. So a higher value of pi, let's say higher value for pi B, means country B has higher inflation. So country B is less efficient in, uh, you know, in, in, in performing the uh, services, therefore there is the fiscal cost is higher. Um, and country A in that sense is relatively stronger, okay? And we're going to vary the parameter pi B and pi A just to see how a country's fiat currency strength is going to affect the dynamics of competition and the dynamics of currency prices or currency valuation in that regard, okay? In the baseline, we're going to take pi B to be four, so that would uh, correspond to countries that are non-dominant in terms of currency strength, but not the weakest either. Later on, we're going to set Pi B to a larger number, say 20, to model small open economies that are really suffering from dollarization and inflation, for example. And once we solve the model numerically, um, there are a number of insights that we can gain. First, uh, without repeating myself on that feedback effect, the feedback effect is there. Uh, for uh, a, a country's fiat currency. But what the cryptocurrency is really doing is, is acting as a buffer zone between the two countries in, in terms of their uh, has on currency competition. So the rise of cryptocurrency is going to hurt A, as we can see from these plots. PA is the uh, valuation of currency A, right? We're plotting it uh, against the X axis, uh, which is, either in terms of the uh, productivity of the growth, the, the, the productivity of the crypto sector or the calendar time version of that. Um, so currency A is definitely hurt uh, from the introduction of uh, cryptocurrency because it just presents competition uh, against currency A. 
The introduction of cryptocurrency has two effects on currency B. There is a direct competition effect, but at the same time, by weakening the dominance of currency A, it weakens the competition from A on B. And depending on the parameters, it could be that cryptocurrency is benefiting the weaker currency, at least in the, in the short run. And we can see that from the middle panel here, uh, where the valuation of a B could be monotone um, in the level of development of the crypto sector or cyber sector. We can even view that as a digital sector uh, to some extent. Um, what about the strategic considerations for the countries to introduce CBDC? Well, let's first look at how the introduction of CBDC affects the value of uh, the currencies. So the top left panel is just showing when uh, currency X is digitized, CBDC of X is introduced, how that changes the valuation of currency X. When um, we're looking at a weaker country where uh, we use this red dotted line to denote, um, it could potentially uh, increase the valuation of that currency. Depending on whether we're talking about the introduction of CBDC, when the crypto sector is still nascent versus it's more mature. Um, but for the stronger um, fiat, or the, the stronger country, A, introduction of the uh, CBDC is not going to help it too much, at least when the crypto sector is still small, basically lower values of Y. Um, so CBDC by non-dominant currencies would have the largest effect. And that's why these countries are the most motivated to introduce cryptocurrency. And we also show that if CBDC is introduced in the early stage of crypto development, it could nip the growth, crypto growth in the bud. If you look at the lower right uh, panel, uh, which shows the uh, impact on price of crypto when uh, one of the countries introduce CBDC and it's going to have an active impact, especially when the crypto sector is small, okay, in terms of percentage. Um, and if we look at um, the incentives for different countries to introduce CBDC, the non-dominant country, the country with non-dominant currency has the highest incentive, but it's actually followed by the countries with the strongest currency. And uh, recall EA and EB denotes the effort level of the central banks to introduce CBDC. Country A, the stronger country, actually has a two-picked incentive. The intuition is that when the crypto sector is still small, there is an incentive to uh, nip it in the, uh, in the bud and just uh, use a kind of a killer adoption of digitized money to prevent competition from cryptocurrency space and any growth in that space. But once it grows to a certain level, that benefit um, has decreased. Um, so a country A wouldn't want to, wouldn't have a strong incentive to introduce CBDC. Until later, when the crypto sector grows to be too big to ignore, um, the competition of digitized payment system is just too strong, then country A has to uh, ramp up the effort to introduce CBDC if it's not already introduced. Um, and the, the weakest or the last in line for CBDC are the countries with really high pi B, high inflation, the weakest currency. And uh, hopefully I'll get to that in a slide or two. Um, I think I might have a, a couple more minutes here. Um, in terms of the strategic effect of introducing CBDC, once the stronger country A introduces CBDC, it pretty much kills all incentives for the weaker country to introduce CBDC. Because um, uh, e even when they introduce CBDC, they are still subject to digital dollarization in a sense. But if the weaker country introduces CBDC first, it could lead to a stronger incentive for the stronger country to introduce CBDC because it basically mitigates the uh, original dollarization and presents a stronger competition for country A. And country A could respond by introducing their CBDC 
to increase the convenience um, yield from holding that country's currency uh, in order to, to compete. I've been talking about introducing CBDC um, to, to increase convenience yield. That's just one way to model it. There are other ways to, to uh, capture this net benefit of introducing CBDC, but using convenience yield is uh, convenient, no, no pun intended. Um, in terms of how different currency strengths is going to lead to different incentives for launching CBDC, uh, we, we can show that when Pi A is high, that means A's currency, even though it's the stronger one, is, is not super dominant. Um, that means country A actually has some incentive to introduce CBDC. But if it's super dominant, the rise of crypto uh, sector doesn't pose as strong a threat to its dominance. So initially, it wouldn't have strong incentives to introduce uh, CBDC. Okay. We can also relate that to financial innovation to the extent that the growth of the crypto sector leads to financial innovation such as you know, decentralized exchange. Um, we, we can look at the probability of CBDC being introduced or um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the calendar time uh, that leads to um, a, a particular level of productivity in the crypto sector when the CBDC is introduced. So if a country is uh, strong, that means it has low Pi A, country A is strong, then it actually creates some inertia in the sense that because it's too strong, it doesn't care about um, the competition presented by cryptocurrencies, and therefore it doesn't innovate quickly. Um, and that's going to have implications for the dynamic growth of the crypto sector as well. And finally, uh, I just want to present this one picture and then I'll uh, wrap up. Um, if we look at developing countries, countries with a fairly high Pi B, that means it's suffering a lot from inflation, right? That's one way to interpret high Pi B. Um, what's going to happen is if you look at this dotted yellow line, as compared to the baseline we have, baseline has Pi B equals to four, the dotted yellow line has Pi B equals to 20. Uh, and, and the vertical axis is just uh, plotting the impact on valuation for currency B when the strong uh, country introduces CBDC. So when say the US introduces uh, digital dollars, what's the impact on El Salvador or Nigeria, for example, um, that would be captured by this curve. It's actually going to, um, uh, you know, in, in the, in the de depending on when the introduction happens, if we are introducing it when the crypto sector is uh, really big, the impact of this digital dollar, dollarization on the weakest countries could be even greater. So in the long run, um, small open economies do suffer from digital dollarization. What's their best strategic response? Um, it's not helpful to develop their own digital currencies because their fiat is weak to start with. So it wouldn't help with the competition too much. Um, it turns out that one effective way they could respond to dollarization or digital dollarization is to adopt a cryptocurrency. Um, in our paper, we don't discuss stable coins that's packed to a basket of currencies, but in reality, that would work pretty well for these smaller economies. If they adopt a stable coin packed to the US dollar, and that stable coin also requires a reserve in terms of US dollars, then again, it's going to boost demand for US dollar, which is going to, again, allow uh, any monetary policy to uh, affect these small open economies. So that's, that's what we mean by this packing order. Developing countries actually have the least incentive to adopt, um, to, to, to introduce their own CBDC. They could adopt some form of cryptocurrency in order to, uh, to, to, to remain competitive and um, uh, avoid suffering from dollarization in, in this space. So, so with that, um, I think I'm uh, right on time, or maybe I have, yeah, I'm right on time, I believe. Um, so I'm just going to conclude 
So in this paper, we uh, build a, a dynamic model of currency competition across multiple countries, allowing each country to uh, potentially use different forms of money, including digital currency that's issued by central banks. Central bank digital currency issuance is really a strategic consideration. Um, it's essentially a response to competition from cryptocurrency sector, as well as from the digital currencies introduced by the uh, competing, uh, com competing uh, country. And we do uh, find a packing order for CBDC issuance, strong non-dominant first, strongest currency uh, second, followed uh, by the weakest economies. There are a number of further implications um, on financial innovation on the long run outcome of uh, currency competition uh, that we discuss in the paper. Uh, but in the interest of time, I haven't uh, been able to cover more details there. So I'll stop here and happy to take questions from- Well, well thank you very much. So there are two interesting questions. So the first one is from Harold Ulick. And he's asking whether uh, he's curious about what would happen if alpha is less than zero and uh, has this possibility that success of the private cryptocurrencies makes people sour on official currencies. So maybe you can uh, talk about this and then I'll ask the second question. Sure. So let me just go back to the uh, formulation. And then uh, alpha is the um, basically the amount that one would benefit from the productivity of crypto sector. So what uh, Harold was asking, what, what if um, the cryptocurrency sector development actually hurts uh, people's uh, convenience when holding the fiat currency? Uh, we could allow that to happen as long, I think the main results would go through as long as CH you know, subtract by that uh, uh, reduction is still higher than ZL. Uh, otherwise introducing CBDC uh, represents a net loss in convenience flow. Um, that would lead to, I think, uh, you know, countries not spending effort to launch CBDC. Um, so, so that's that's what what's going to happen when alpha is smaller than zero. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. In general, I just want to point out it doesn't have to be you know technological progress in in blockchain. Uh, it, it could be just uh, innovative designs within the ecosystem. Uh, many DeFi protocols are good examples. Uh, we, we, instead of uh, market making, we could have uh, automated or algorithmic based uh, market making, so on and so forth. So the second question is from Ivan Rodriguez, uh, who is uh, uh, asked to comment on uh, the relationship of your work uh, to the uh, for a majority paper on a model of international monetary system in, in QG, and uh, whether how whether your model is consistent, contradictory, or anything else compared to the results of uh, a far a majority. Yeah. So um, our findings are broadly consistent with what they have um, over there. Uh, if I recall correctly, they do not uh, introduce a. Um, additional digital sector that, um, you know, you can view this as a, uh, a third country joining the competition of two uh, uh, hegemonic uh, currency uh, regimes. Um, but the key difference here is we do allow the crypto sector to grow endogenously. And um, there, is a, um, there, is, there, there is an important effect of increasing the competition against cryptocurrency early in order to slow its uh, growth. So that, that's an that's a interesting finding we have. And in terms of strategic implementation of digital money, uh, that's something we uh, offer new insights on as well. But it, I, I wouldn't say it's contradicting what they find. Great, so another interesting question from uh, Paul and uh, Carl Mel. Um, and uh, uh, the question is, uh, whether uh, both stable coins and CBDC, uh, is there a situation when they're going to coexist as means, means of payment? Or uh, your solution is always it's either uh, one or the other? Yeah, so in our, uh, in our model, uh, it's uh, 
cryptocurrencies, including stablecoin, can uh, coexist with CBDC. They, they can still be competing. What we didn't allow is the coexistence of fiat and a digital version of the fiat. Um, so in that sense, uh, we, we do allow this situation. And um, I, I think, you know, it, it's speculation. I think it's going to be um, the case that uh, there's going to be some form of digital payment uh, or both run by private parties and central governments. I just think it's really hard to ban, for example, Bitcoin completely, given the uh, anonymous uh, nature and uh, decentralized nature of, of the project. There are some centralized uh, DeFi projects, I think that are easier to trace down and regulate. Um, but if it's a fully decentralized protocol, um, I'm of the opinion that it's hard to completely regulate it out. Uh, in that sense, uh, it's got to coexist in this uh, in this uh, economy. And I think Harold and Cossers also have some work on um, currencies, basically multiple currencies existing within the within the same economy due to the rise of cryptocurrencies. Um, Okay, great. So uh, there are some other questions, but I think Simon answered uh, them directly in the question and answer. So please uh, ask your questions in the Q&A uh, section on the, on the Zoom. And uh, now we'll have uh, uh, Daryl uh, present his work. <clears throat> thanks so much, Ali, and thanks to Fahad. And uh, Will, thanks for the great presentation. I had a chance, as you know, to get a preview of your paper with uh, Simon, and I'm a big fan and I think it's probably the first uh, important paper in the area of uh, international competition for CBDCs. Uh, as Ale kind of hinted in his introduction, for which I'm very grateful, uh, I've been uh, working uh, on sort of policy discussion of CBDCs for the last while. And uh, I'd like to uh, basically stay at a high level and pass on some of the findings of a big policy report uh, that I co-directed with Elizabeth Economy. I'm going to I'm going to uh, send a URL in the chat uh, right now, and then I'm going to show you some slides. So let's see if I can make this simple. Uh, this is the title of uh, of our policy report. And nothing that I'm saying necessarily implicates our policy group, but we had, uh, you know, several former Treasury undersecretaries, uh, four former members of the National Security Council of the United States, former leading uh, heads of central banks, uh, computer science experts, economists, uh, uh, 30 major policy experts. And uh, we focused on what China is doing and what the United States might be doing or should be doing in response, uh, not only in response to China, but in response to its own needs. So you're going you're gonna to see in the next few minutes uh, a very high level discussion of these policy issues, some of which will overlap with, with what Will was discussing. Uh, so I'm going to keep this real simple, uh, minimize the number of uh, stochastic equations. Uh, here's Alice. Uh, she's at the bakery. She needs to buy a loaf of bread from Bob the baker. And uh, we're, we're, the policy issues we're facing here today is how is she going to pay for the bread? And uh, this could be one of what's one use case of many potential cases, but I think it might help enliven the, your intuition. <clears throat> so the since the early 1600s, uh, when uh, the Banco del Giro in Venice uh, started this idea, the, the almost universal way for doing this other than handing over paper money is for Alice to send a message to her bank, asking the bank to reduce her balances by $8 and to credit the balances of Bob's bank in his favor for $8. And in modern practice, this could be done with a Visa card uh, message could be done with a direct payment uh, message, a debit card, or even a paper check, which is still used in the United States. It could be used with a fast payment service uh, like PayPal or Visa Direct. Uh, it's, there are a lot of different ways to do this, but basically they all work the same way. 
as far as digital payments for now. And as Will suggested, things are changing. Uh, this is the this payment method that I just described is often referred to as a bank railed payment because Alice, who might be uh, customer one up here of bank one, is relying on her bank to forward uh, basically the debits and credits through the system, possibly involving uh, the central bank, uh, eventually down to uh, Bob, who may be customer seven of, of bank three. Uh, and Eric, this, uh, yeah. Would you mind just uh, refresh your screen a little bit? I think it's frozen on the display. Hmm. Is it uh, still frozen on your end? Yeah. So my screen is paused. I wonder what that means. Move to bottom. I'm not sure what's happening. Let me I'm escape. Try the screen one more time. Yeah, I'm going to try it the more conventional way. No, that works. Uh, I'm going to try doing it the way I. Whoops. Yeah, good. Let's try. Uh, new share. Hang on. Okay, is my screen visible again? No, no, it's visible. I thought actually it was the, the long introduction. Now I'm glad to. Okay, you well, see also the nice picture. Did you see this picture before of Alice paying Bob through the? Uh, uh, I did not. It was still the first. Okay, so let me repeat uh, that basically there are many different ways to do this, uh, but the vast majority of digital payments are done by Alice sending a message to her bank instructing her bank to debit uh, her account and credit Bob's account at his bank. And this, uh, this is actually, it seems very simple for Alice. It's actually involves a lot on the back end and a lot of delays and costs in most cases. And in the case of the most common retail applications in most of the developed market world, it involves uh, a credit card or something similar where Bob is actually paying a significant interchange fee and not getting the money very quickly. That's especially the case in the United States. And uh, for the reasons uh, that I think are apparent to the hundred and some people that are watching today, people are looking for ways to improve on this. And most people are turning to digital currencies of new types like CBDCs and stable coins. I'm gonna keep it broad. I'm gonna also include in my discussion how to improve the bank rail payment system because uh, I think you can take it as a given uh, that it's going to be in the United States perhaps 10 years or more before a CBDC is going to come into use. And there's a lot of questioning about whether a CBDC is actually going to do the trick uh, depending on regulations, which I'll get to. So let's not give up on the bank rail payment system quite yet, even though I'm strongly in favor of uh, full-on technology development uh, by countries like the U.S. and many others of CBDC. So this bank rail payment system, uh, it's not dead yet. Uh, uh, this is a system in which money wends its way through the banking system from ultimate payer to ultimate payee. Now, the first major country to introduce a CBDC is China. Uh, it's said to be in pilot stage, but there's already over 100 million people with wallets in China that are using, or at least could use this uh, payment system by which the operation is pretty simple, but uh, it's pretty similar to what we just had. Alice sends a message to her payment service provider, which in most cases will be a bank. And that message will instruct the central bank to deduct $8 from Alice's account and into and put it into Bob's account. And Bob gets the message. Typically, this will be a real-time gross settlement. Bob will have the money instantly. There will be a very low fee, if any fee at all. Uh, Bob and Alice will still, in most cases, work through payment service providers rather than directly through their central banks. And if the United States does this, the U.S. has also suggested it will take this hybrid approach in which the interface with uh, the general economy is done by commercial payment service providers like banks. Now, China is a bit ironic that China is adopting this system because it already has one of the most advanced digital payment uh, retail environments in the world with Alipay and WeChat Pay covering 
well over 90% of urban payments, uh, customer to merchant and customer to customer payments in China. Uh, there are other reasons that China may be doing this. Uh, some of them are typical, uh, like getting ready for the disappearance of paper money, making sure there's an official substitute for digital payments. Uh, but there's also an issue of China wanting to have control uh, over such a, a critical element of infrastructure and data in its economy. China has a centrally planned economy with a significant amount of control exerted by uh, China's government and, and the Chinese Communist Party. And I'm not going to dwell on the issues of privacy, but the PBOC, the Central Bank of China, has said that Alice's and Bob's details will be kept private, uh, but in China that the Central Bank is directly reporting to uh, China's uh, Communist Party, the heads of the Central Bank are uh, holding official positions as heads in the Chinese Communist Party. And if uh, the PBOC were directed to provide that information uh, by the government uh, or by its security apparatus, uh, I, I don't know if, uh, if the PBOC could simply ignore that uh, directive. It's not independent. The People's Bank of China, as I said, is following a hybrid approach where it's involving banks, mobile phone uh, distributors, fintech providers. Uh, it's quite an impressive ecosystem. It's well thought out. It allows offline payments and to some extent allows for cross-border payments, which I'll get to, which is the key issue in, in the paper by Will and Simon. However, uh, we're as, as Will suggested, we're also discussing alternatives, including private stable coins, by which Alice will go to her bank probably, or her payment service provider, or a crypto exchange and provide uh, the fiat currency in exchange for a stable coin. And if stable coins are widely accepted in the payment system, uh, then Alice can do her payments that way. Right now, uh, stable coins are used by and large for cryptocurrency exchange, but I will ex I, I would expect them to come into real uh, economy payments in the near future, especially for cross-border payments, which are very expensive and slow. The uh, President's Working Group on Stablecoins in the United States, the President's Working Group report on stablecoins recommends that this uh, uh, stablecoins used in the payment system be heavily controlled uh, and be issued only by regulated depository institutions, uh, which has some controversy because if the main problem is that the bank rail payment system is not sufficiently competitive uh, and not sufficiently open to competition, uh, then you might wonder, well, why would this be better? Uh, and we can maybe that uh, be a good topic for discussion. Uh, but it does, in principle, allow for smart contracting, uh, the Internet of Things, and so on. A CBDC in the United States or in China, my guess is, will not be built on a blockchain initially. In China, it's not on a blockchain. In the U.S., it's unlikely to be for a host of reasons, some of which have to do with throughput limits. Uh, but those limits may be uh, exceeded in the next years, and it's not ruled out, but it doesn't seem to be uh, suitable for scale at this point. A big initiative uh, in many governments is to increase financial inclusion, and it's widely viewed that a CBDC may contribute to increasing financial inclusion. Uh, this uh, bar chart from Findex, which is a World Bank initiative, shows that financial inclusion is lower in emerging market economies than in, than in developed market economies. But even in the United States, there are roughly 5 million households that don't have access to digital payments or a bank and they're using very uh, expensive and slow payment methods. Uh, so uh, financial inclusion, if it's an important initiative, uh, and it is an important initiative, uh, puts policymakers a bit under stress because so far at least CBDC doesn't necessarily increase financial inclusion. That remains to be seen. Uh, if CBDC drives out paper money, and it might, it might, uh, that would be the last uh, thing that you would want to have happen to those without access to digital devices or bank accounts. 
because they, they are currently relying very heavily on paper money to conduct payments. Uh, I recently went to Stockholm and was told by my hotel that I could not pay my hotel bill with paper uh, kroner because uh, nobody takes paper kroner in Sweden anymore. Everybody's using digital payments. CBDC might accelerate that. Another concern with CBDC is that if it's provided on an interoperable basis, it might work, but if it's provided hybrid and each payment service provider is providing it on a different type of application program interface, uh, then you know, if, when Alice goes to the bakery, she's gonna have to make sure that Bob's CBDC app can handle Alice's CBDC app. And so it's, CBDC alone is not necessarily going to increase interoperability. It, it's gonna require regulation. It would also require regulation to make sure that there's an incentive for Alice to pay with her CBDC app because currently uh, Alice is getting United Airline miles or rewards on her credit card. And most, you know, the, the, the tap your phone service that she gets with her Visa card is basically the same as what she would get with her CBDC. And so I think you would need to regulate interchange fees that fund Alice's reward miles if you want Alice to choose to use her CBDC app. So that's another concern is what is the incentive that's going to break open the two-sided market network effects of credit card uh, based payments that tend to lock in uh, Alice's uh, and Bob's for that matter, uh, 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 role in the uh, Visa card or MasterCard or credit card system. I'm gonna to turn to some of the issues that, uh, that came up in Will's talk. I'm gonna go international for a little while and then we'll, I'll come back. I'm gonna make sure I watch the time carefully too. So cross-border payments, right now it's a very, very slow, expensive system. Alice, if she's customer one of bank one in first country and Bob is customer two of bank six in the second, in the second country, then they need to find uh, a, a linking banks, correspondent banks, and all of the AML KYC checks for legality of payments have to be done. There's lots of delays, lots of frustration. If you've ever made a payment uh, cross-border, uh, using banks, I'm sure you know what I mean. And stable coins have a potentially important role to play here because they can make this much simpler. CBDCs can also uh, simplify cross-border payments. This is the MCBDC design that's currently being implemented by Thailand, Hong Kong, the United Arab Emirates, and China. And this uh, diagram uh, which is adapted from uh, Project Lithanon uh, initiative at Th the Bank of Thailand, shows how a Thai bank, a customer of a Thai bank might get a payment done to a customer of a, of a Chinese bank by exchanging CBDCs in a special corridor for exchanging CBDCs uh, of the two countries. And that, I'm not gonna give you the details, but but basically there's an exchange of CBDCs with some foreign exchange liquidity provision in this corridor. A lot of people, when they talk about cross-border payments with CBDCs, they're thinking of you know, China's uh, ECNY CBDC circulating inside Thailand. Most cross-border CBDC payments will not be like that. They're not going to be one CBDC in one country from one country circulating inside the payment system of another country. There'll be some of that, I imagine, but I think there's going to be international agreements by which at least the largest uh, and most responsible central banks will, just as China's central bank has said, we will not be invading the monetary sovereignty of another country doing currency substitution. That would be considered a very, very aggressive uh, attack effectively on the monetary system of another country. Uh, certainly the United States, I'm pretty confident, is not going to give people all over the world accounts in the US central bank indirectly or indirectly. Now there will be cross-border payments with CBDCs at some point involving corridors like this one or uh, involving exchange of a CBDC at the border with 
a fiat currency in, an, in another uh, domicile. But I don't think we're going to, except for a few exceptions or bad behavior, I don't think we're going to see CBDCs widely circulating in other countries. Dollarization is not going to be uh, an accepted policy. Uh, and coming back to the issue that is raised in the paper by Will and Simon, uh, I get the economics of what you just described, but in terms of the politics, I would actually expect stable coins to be uh, the initial thing that is going to allow dollarization or renminbiization. Uh, USDC or Tether or uh, CNHC, which is a RMB denominated stable coin, are not going to be limited in the way that central banks are limited in providing uh, wallets for everybody that wants them. And uh, my, my imagination suggests that uh, cross-border uh, and within foreign country use of stable coins will be more dominant uh, than, uh, than CBDC use. But we'll see, at least in the first years, and I think uh, for a long time. The US government is concerned either way. This is a, uh, an excerpt from the Treasury, uh, US Treasury's sanction review from last fall. This is even before the invasion of Ukraine, uh, suggesting that, uh, quote, these technologies offer malign actors opportunities to hold and transfer funds outside the traditional dollar-based financial system and empower our adversaries seeking to build new financial and payment systems intended to diminish the dollar's global role. We're mindful of the risk that left unchecked. These digital assets and payment systems could harm the efficiency of our sanctions. And there's already been a ton of discussion of this in the press. How are uh, those uh, subjected to sanctions uh, reacting by using alternative cross-border payment systems? And uh, I, I would expect stablecoins and other cryptocurrencies to, uh, to come into greater use. So far, there's not enough acceptance for them in the real payment, in the real payment market, that is in the real economy. But I would expect that, that the United States has applied so many sanctions and so has, has its partners in Europe that eventually the actors that want to avoid sanctions are going to figure out how to do it with stablecoins and other alternative payment systems. There are also alternatives to the SWIFT-based payment system, and China has one of them called CIPS, and uh, a membership in CIPS is growing, and presumably now includes uh, a lot more cross-border payments with Russia, uh, and in fact, there's some evidence of that just recently. So uh, the greater, I'm not uh, taking a political stand here, I'm just saying the greater the use of sanctions, uh, the more we should expect uh, alternative payment systems to be used. And uh, this involves, uh, you know, more than the economics of convenience. Uh, it's partly a geopo geopolitical issue. The last thing I want to talk about, uh, making sure that I'm staying in the in line here. I've got about five more minutes. Is that right, Ali? Um, maybe a little bit more, I don't know. Okay, I'll, I'll be cautious. I le I've left to last what I think of as probably the most, uh, well, in the near and midterm, the most effective option for a country like the United States, and in fact, many countries, which is to upgrade the bank railed payment system with fast payments. So this basically, it's a technical term, a fast payment system. It means an RTGS system, real-time gross settlement, by which you can move money directly from Alice to Bob uh, through their bank accounts, 24-7, uh, 365. Bob gets the money instantly. He will typically pay a very low fee and he doesn't, uh, he doesn't uh, get upset about uh, credit cards taking a giant chunk out of his, out of his profit margin. Uh, so it lowers counterparty risk and improves uh, the efficiency of the payment system. And it has the potential to increase financial inclusion probably more easily than some of the other method, methods that we've discussed. And many countries listed below here have already been uh, adopting fast payment systems, but with various uh, uh, speeds. And I wanna focus on the case of Brazil. Uh, the vertical axis in this chart is transactions per capita in the fast payment system. And the horizontal axis is how many years 
after the launch of the past payment system did it take to get that degree of adoption? And you can see that Brazil is the outlier. Brazil is, is really uh, getting very fast adoption. This is a domestic issue of its past, past payment system. And why is that? Well, uh, one of the reasons that Brazil is getting fast adoption is that it's not providing its fast payment system to the banks as most other countries are doing and then allowing the banks to choose how to provide fast payment services to their customers. Rather, the Bank of Brazil built its own app and is providing that app for fast payments to everyone in the economy. So it's interoperability by design. Basically, there's one hub application. You can put it on your mobile phone and you can pull money out of your bank account and put it to anyone else using a common app. You can move your money from one account to another uh, and the, the, the switching costs for dealing with one bank versus another, the wall garden effect goes way down. Here is the comparison of the cost to the merchant of using cards in credit cards in red, debit cards, and in Brazil, the fast payment system. Now, the cost uh, in the European Union is an outlier. Why is that? Well, because interchange fees in the European Union are highly regulated, which is another approach to improving the bank rail payment system. If you lower those interchange fees, then Alice is going to, when she goes to Bob the Baker and she says, oh, I think I might use my credit card because I get all those airline miles, she's going to find out, oh, I don't get so many in Europe because that's regulated down. So she might use her fast payment app or her CBDC app so interchange fees are actually a barrier to entry that should be regulated down and fast payment systems can help uh, lower those uh, costs to merchants. So I'm gonna skip that slide in the interest of time and uh, simply say that uh, central banks are worried about all of this innovation of CBDC or other entrants to the payment system like stable coins because there's a concern uh, that they could reduce the aggregate amount of deposits in the banking system, I'm just quoting here, which could in turn increase bank funding expenses, which would in turn, according to this suggested theory, reduce credit provision. I've given you a couple of quotes here. The first one is from the Federal Reserve's paper on CBDC, the famous paper that came out a couple months ago. And the second quote is from a G7 paper, and they're both suggesting this story uh, which I, I see Harold Willig is here today, he and I have discussed, that if uh, banks have to compete harder for deposits against CBDCs or stable coins or fast payment systems, that's going to raise their deposit funding costs. I agree with that. And then it's suggested that that will reduce credit provision. I disagree that that's uh, likely to be the case. I'm going to give you an, first an example of the evidence on uh, where the where the problem lies, uh, there's no competition or very little competition for deposits in the US. This is the uh, comparison, the last time that US wholesale rates were at any uh, local peak, which was in April, 2019, the Fed funds rate was at 240 basis points. And the average uh, across the US deposit interest rates were minuscule. The reason being uh, that banks are able to take advantage of their depositors through stickiness and switching costs and probably lack of attention. So along comes a CBDC or a fast payment system and suddenly they have to compete for these deposits. Deposit interest rates would go way up, I agree. Uh, but then what would happen to credit provision? So, uh, well, uh, this is gonna happen pretty quickly and I might not get my message through before the end, uh, but if, if a bank is already active in wholesale markets, which describes more than half of the US payment system, then my prediction is almost nothing will uh, happen with respect to loss or credit provision because when the bank in the middle of this diagram is considering whether to fund a certain borrower, the bank is really thinking, well, should I lend to the borrower or should I lend into the bond market where I'm already finding it economic to raise wholesale funding to lend into the bond market, or maybe even to lend into the loan market. So really my hurdle rate for making a loan is, does it earn me a profit when my funding costs are the wholesale rate? 
if the deposit interest rate, which is woefully low and is giving me great profitable opportunities to raise cheap deposits, if the deposit rate goes up, well, I'm going to lose profit, but I'm not going to uh, change the hurdle rate at which I would make loans. That's a very, very short, uh, because of interest of time, discussion. But if you look at the papers at the bottom of this page, uh, you'll find uh, different conclusions on this, but I would particularly point you to the work of Cho, Davudul, Hosseini, Jiang, and Zhu, and the recent work of Tony Whitehead, Wu, and Xiao, Kai Rong Xiao, uh, which uh, I think do a pretty good job. They're the most sophisticated models available. Pretty good job of showing that uh, the concerns over credit provision are way overplayed. Last slide. What are the main policies available? Well, uh, the, I think the lowest hanging fruit in terms of policy advance in this area is not CBDC. I think it's used regulations and fast payment infrastructure to promote, promote a more open, efficient, and competitive bank rail payment system. Why? Well, because that's feasible and it has solved certain of problems that CBDCs can't easily solve with current technology. Uh, at the same time, allow or encourage private stable coins and fintech novel banks to enter the payment system to add to the competition for banks. And at the same time, begin the development of CBDC technology so that it's capable of providing the kinds of services that could, could bring the economy into the new, the new uh, digital future involving smart contracting and other uh, services that a CBDC would be best equipped to provide. But that technology is simply not ready to deploy. And so discussing uh, whether to do CBDC or something else right now doesn't make sense if you don't have the CBDC technology. Something that protects privacy, is cyber resilient, allows smart contracting, allows offline payments, increases financial inclusion. Uh, all of those things are, uh, they're not currently possible and they need to be developed. So there should be an intensive technology exploration and President Biden's order that Will mentioned will hopefully uh, generate that kind of technology exploration. Thanks very much, Ali. I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Daryl. So let me uh, maybe answer or ask some of the questions so you can answer them. So the first is uh, Harold, and actually that's the question that was often, I think, asked, and he's uh, asked the following question. So for cross-border payments across banks, uh, wouldn't the current framework suffice? Because we already have the corresponding relationship between different, uh, different banks. And if you give a Thai bank just access to Chinese central bank, is this exactly the same as already exists? Uh, well, the current system is very, very slow because each bank along the chain takes a profit margin, uh, has to do the AML KYC check. It's only doing these services during banking hours. Uh, and every, every check along the way involves a different sort of bureaucracy and a different regulatory regime. And uh, I'm, I'm confident that almost everybody here has tried to do this. It's not very easy to do. The, the pipes are all connected, but they're not connected very well. A CBDC could allow this to happen with one leap. If each country has a CBDC, you could do what I mentioned in this corridor. You could launch a request to make a payment to, you know, I could launch one to make a payment to my auntie in Milan, uh, Italy, and there would be one round of FX intermediation, could be automatic for retail size payments, and, and the thing would be done uh, pretty quickly and easily. Uh, and the BIS has a number of different models for how to do this. I mean, the vast, the way into the future, there could be a direct CBDC to CBDC exchange, but probably in the near, you know, the next 15 years, it'll be some sort of a wholesale corridor that exchanges CBDCs, that would be better. Possibly a stable coin payment would be real, real simple as well. So, uh, so that's another possibility. Excellent. The second question is uh, from Ivan Rodriguez. And uh, the question is uh, whether the non-central bank tokens are gonna be regulated out of existence and in particular, uh, th there is certain incentive for the central banks to do this to limit competition in the space. So what, what's your take on that? Well, I agree that that's a big concern and the president's working group report on stable coins is taking a conservative viewpoint when saying only depo regulated depository institutions should be able to issue stable coins. Now, on the other hand, they could change the definition of a regulated depository institution to include 
new fintech firms that are well regulated and nobody wants to see a stable coin that's not well regulated you don't want any money laundering you don't want cyber uh, attacks to be successful you don't want operational failures you want the reserves to you know to be really solid so regulation is a is not really a thing you want to compromise but I think there's probably a way to do it uh, with regulation and get more competition, especially in the cross-border area. So, so an interesting question from Augustina Capone, actually, a rather subtle question, I think, is, so if you have the influence of the fast payment, then on one hand, you are decreasing uh, the, some of the risk, risks, uh, but then you're increasing some of the other risks. So it's a clearing, or settlement versus counterparty or liquidity risk. So what's your, what's your take on, on this? The faster payments are great, but so for example, you accidentally send it to somebody else or you create all kinds of other issues. Huh? Well, I'm not sure that there's nearly as much uh, counterparty risk or operational risk with a fast payment as there would be with, uh, let's say a stable coin or some sort of non-bank rail payment. After all, the fast payment systems are run by central banks. The payments are effectively guaranteed uh, to operationally by the central bank. It is true that if I make a payment and it, it's instant, then uh, I can't change my mind and get my money back. And if I made a payment to a fraudulent uh, phone number that someone tricked me into paying them, I can't call the central bank and say, reverse that payment like I could with let's say a fraud on my visa card. Uh, so that, is, that, I mean, that is a concern and a consumer protection becomes uh, trickier because you have to, you have real time settlement. But as far as the operational side, uh, you know, these are already working around the world and they're, they're quite cyber resilient. So I'm not that worried about it. So Kirill Shaknov, Kirill, hi. Uh, I haven't seen you for a long time. So he's asking the question about uh, in your opinion, what are the broad incentives to encourage stable coins? And maybe one should not encourage them. Well, there are good there are good and bad incentives. A bad incentive would be, well, depending on whether you think sanctions are a good idea. If you think they're a good idea, uh, sanctions, then you might say a bad incentive to use stable coins is to avoid sanctions. A good incentive to use stable coins would be to cut through the very expensive bank rail payment system, especially for cross-border payments. So we and also to add competition, if people start using stable coins to make uh, a lot of payments, banks will, will wake up and say, oh, I guess, I guess they're using the other thing because we're doing such a bad job. Uh, so then they will uh, improve the, the efficiency and lower the costs of, of bank rail payments. Uh, and banks themselves are gonna introduce stable coins uh, and compete in that area. Also, for wholesale purposes like security settlement and FX exchange settlement, stablecoins are really lowering counterparty risk and, uh, and speeding up settlement. Uh, you can also do smart contracting. So there's lots of great uh, incentives to use stablecoins. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan uh, as long as they're well regulated. Uh, an interesting question from Norbert Kier. So he's asking the following. So uh, does the US have time to catch up uh, with, uh, with China. Uh, how long will it take us to develop the CBDC technology and maybe they already have an insurmountable advantage. And it's great to have the, you know, the Senate subcommittees and uh, uh, you, Daryl, and, uh, and Will to think about this, but maybe it's better to just do it and they have the first mover advantage on So what do you think about it? Well, the first, advantage, first mover advantage for China is notable, uh, prestige, setting international standards, and getting on with improving their payment system. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, the United States has to give up or must do it uh, worse than China because they're coming second. I think there's actually a second mover advantage as well for the United States, which th they can do it with better technology. China's technology requires lots of privacy. US could avoid that. The US, if it is patient and it, uh, and it makes improvements in technology can use uh, blockchain or DLT based technologies that will allow the internet of things and uh, lots of you know, smart contracting opportunities uh, to come to fruition. China's approach is not getting there so far. Uh, the United States has not really moved fast enough, but now with President Biden's order, I expect that it, it will move faster and 
even with uh, full on full scale uh, technology exploration and development, I, I would predict 10 years at least before the US can, uh, can get a CBDC that it's happy with deploying in the, in the general economy. It's not, as I said, it's not uh, necessary that a CBDC uh, is used to solve the current problems. They can be solved in the near term and midterm with just better regulation and fast payment systems. The Paul and John uh, Kalmal asked the question on uh, how do you think the CBDCs uh, are they going to affect the exchange rates uh, across different countries where the CBDCs are going to be pegged uh, to fiat uh, currencies and what do you think is going to be the effect on Rama? Uh, that's a, a good question. Uh, well, I mean, to the extent that CBDCs improve monetary policy transmission, then you would expect uh, more faster pass through of US interest rate policy to the rest of the world. Uh, you might expect if, uh, uh, well, effective CBDCs for cross-border exchange might lower the hub role of the US dollar because you would have more bilateral CBDC to CBDC exchange. Uh, so, you know, example, you, you're exchanging Singapore dollars for let's say a Danish kroner, right now you almost always would go through the US dollar as a hub and make two different trades. And that improves the demand for dollars as a, as a liquidity, as a source of liquidity in FX markets and in bond markets. With bilateral or multilateral CBDC exchanges, they wouldn't necessarily have to go through the dollar and that might lower the role of the US dollar in international uh, exchange. Now, if if you, I'm wrong, and if the Fed says, no, oh, we're happy to give dollar accounts to anyone in the world, uh, then that would be game over. The US dollar would be the anchor currency. Uh, everyone would want it for almost, a, you know, for e even more than they currently want it. Uh, and uh, that would definitely in increase the convenience yield associated with dollar assets and raise the demand for dollars, other things equal. But I don't think that's gonna happen. So we have a, a, just a couple of minutes left. So let me turn it to, to Will, who wanted me to talk briefly about uh, the next conference. Thank, thank you, Ale. Thank you, Daryl, for the great presentation. Now I'm just going to put on my kind of uh, organizer hat for, for the uh, Crypto and Economics Research Forum that we've been running. Uh, we are going to have our second annual conference I'm just sharing my slides here so that you can see uh, the quick program. If you go to the cvrforum.org website, uh, you can register there and see um, the whole program. We have six excellent papers. We also have uh, Professor Antoinette Shore as one of the keynote speakers, um, as well as um, Chris Giancarlo uh, as another, the, the other keynote speaker. Um, so it's going to be a great program. I hope all of you can uh, join us. It's going to be hosted at Boston University on uh, May 13th uh, with a reception taking place on May the 12th. Thank you. All right, wonderful. So perhaps with this we can uh, stop this uh, panel, this, uh, this webinar, and uh, thank the wonderful presenters and thank the audience for their interesting and stimulating questions and organizers for putting all of this together. <laughs>